Well, morning, everybody. It is a real privilege uh, to be able to share God's word today. And we're continuing in our series. If you've been following um, over the last few weeks, we're in Acts chapter 7. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to Acts 7, we're on the section verse 9 to 16. But um, if you'll just give me a little bit of leeway this morning, I'd like to introduce our time together today in God's word by just going back into chapter 6. You know, these verses, I'm so glad we're taking them slowly in Ichthus because Stephen's life and the man that he was is worth meditating on and considering. And his words are worth meditating on and considering. He's such an incredible example to us. And I don't want us to lose, as we're going to look particularly at Joseph today, I don't want us to lose the thrust that these are Stephen's words. And it's so important that we understand that and that we understand the heart of Stephen. So if you turn to Acts 6, let me just read a few verses to remind us of who it is who is sharing and speaking these words today. So verse 8 Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Verse 10, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Verse 15, fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. You know, Stephen's been brought before the top legal council, the Sanhedrin, And he's got these two accusations that have been um, brought against him falsely and the accusations to do with the temple and with the law. And here Stephen finds himself needing to bring a defence. And so last week we looked at Abraham and today at Joseph and we will look in the future at Moses and David. These um, great men of faith from the Old Testament. And we're going to look at what it is that Stephen is introducing and saying about where he stands And what is the evidence for the kind of life that he's living and the kind of Jesus that he's proclaiming, the Messiah that he is declaring and making known? And before we move on, I just wonder if we could take a moment to reflect on verse 15. I'm sure you've thought about it before, but where it says that Stephen was, they looked at Stephen and his face was like the face of an angel. And I was reading, someone was commentating on this uh, passage and it stuck with me. They were describing that Stephen almost is stood in the doorway of heaven and earth. And here he is, he can see into heaven and heaven can see him and it's reflecting the angelic on his face. It can be seen. And yet he has very much got his feet on the earth. He's dealing with the accusation and the realities of this unjust situation he finds himself in. And it's almost like all All these verses that we're looking at over these weeks are calling us to come and be like Stephen, to take a position like Stephen, as it were, in our lives on the doorway of heaven and earth, to stand in that place, to see the Lord, to see his glory, to know who we are, to understand who Jesus is, to live in the reflection of his glory and light and victory, but very much to have our feet on the earth and to be applying it. And yes, we may find like Stephen, we are misunderstood. Uh, people don't understand who we are but we will be those that bring in the kingdom that can bring heaven on earth and what a, a calling to us and I wonder if because that is the man that Stephen was it led him to introduce us in his defense to some of these other people who he recognized like me it's almost like he's saying like me look how they were standing in this world look how I'm standing in the world it's so powerful to consider so we looked at Abraham last week and today we're going to think about Joseph and so I'm just going to read for us Acts 7 verse 9 to 16 these are the verses we're going to mainly focus on today the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh king of Egypt and he made him governor over Egypt and all his household Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it. And our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. 
Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. From there they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. The first thing Stephen introduces us to in verse 9 is that straight away that it was jealousy that caused Joseph to be mistreated and sold into slavery. Stephen is not um, kind of talking around the issues, uh, looking at um, the wider situation. You can look back, I'm going to name some of the passages in Genesis. You can go and look again if you like at the incredible story and the detail we're given of the story of the life of Joseph. But really, Stephen gets to the point and he names the issue. The issue was jealousy and because of that they were sold he was sold into slavery yet he doesn't just leave it there and so quickly even in that first verse 9 he's saying yet God was with him but God was with him both things were happening if you like at the same time on the earth here he is being treated unjustly terribly abused in this way beaten and sold um, by his own flesh and blood for money to into slavery if we think about it beyond a story for children and we think about the reality of it it's horrific thing that happened there in that family and yet at the same time Joseph is receiving from God God has not closed heaven to Joseph because of this injustice that's happening to him maybe Stephen if you like after every little bit he's saying here it's almost like Stephen could pause and he's kind of asking the question are you seeing it to those who in the Sanhedrin are you understanding? Can you get it? Do you really realise what I'm saying? Can you see it reflected in what's happening in this very moment? The injustice that's happening here in your accusation to me. But also, do you see heaven is open? God is with me. Do you see this is how the Lord has always acted on the earth? It's like there's a dramatic pause, I, I imagine, after each of these statements. But you know, one of the themes, that sad themes that we have in scripture is again and again this theme that God says that so often the people were seeing, but they did not understand. They were hearing, but they didn't really understand and perceive what was being said. Such a sad state of affairs, such a challenge to us that it's possible to live in this world, to see everything, to, to know everything, to have all the facts right in front of you, and yet not to really understand, to not really be drawn in to what is the truth of what's going on here. Stephen was living in a place of revelation and truth, and he was trying to bring it forward and show it also here from the life of Joseph. You see, just like with Joseph, his brothers wanted to get rid of that prophetic voice. You remember, don't you, that it was his dreams that caused Joseph his problems. <laughs> he brought those two dreams to his family and they were quite insulted by what those dreams seemed to mean. And it was because of that that they did not want that prophetic voice. They didn't want to hear it. If you like, the light was so bright, so intense, they weren't prepared to see it and they wanted to close their eyes to it. It was easier for them to close their eyes and pretend this didn't happen and remove it from their vision than to come into the light themselves and respond to what is being said. They want to get rid of that prophetic voice because of the jealousy that they feel, the irrational anger and hatred. Really, because of dreams, you're doing this? It seems crazy. It seems out of proportion, doesn't it? What it just seems, just let him be. Okay, he's a bit of a dreamer. Just let him be. But it's because there's truth in it. And when there's truth in it, it provokes things in people. If they don't want to come into the light themselves, it provokes an anger and a jealousy and they want to remove the truth. They want to remove the prophetic vision. Do you imagine that there Stephen is pausing, <laughs> saying, don't you see what you're doing here to me? Do you see the reality of what is actually happening here? If you want to, you can turn to Genesis 45, or you can do after our time together today, and remind yourself of the story of Joseph. You know, when we meet Joseph, he is both loved and hated. Quite quickly, we are introduced to the reality that Joseph is favoured by his father, and particularly loved, and particularly doted upon. And at the same time, we are quickly introduced that his brothers hated him, and were angry at him and rejected him because of this. And we see 
see that quite quickly, that hatred that they have is not just some childish sibling rivalry that kind of disappears and it's just foolishness. We see that it's a real jealousy that is going deeper and deeper and deeper to form hatreds and anger where they could even contemplate his death, killing him themselves with their own hands. It's what jealousy can breed in us. And maybe some of us, we feel quite a lot of sympathy for Joseph. He's a young man, he's 17, he's enthusiastic, he's getting these incredible revelations prophetically, he's speaking out these incredible dreams, and we feel a bit of sympathy for him. And at the same time, we feel sympathy that this jealousy brews in his brother's hearts. It feels so unfair for this young man. We also may ask ourselves, do we think Jacob's parenting is very wise at this point? Do we feel that, jo that Jacob, if he had been a little wiser with his sons, not showing this kind of favoritism, maybe not so, um, showing partiality to Joseph, that it might have helped the brothers cope with Joseph's particular giftings and abilities. And sometimes maybe we wish that Jacob had had more wisdom in these moments, that we wouldn't see this sibling's relationship uh, relationships become so destructive and destroyed. You know, throughout our look at Joseph, we can't help but reflect maybe on our own lives and our own families and our own relationships. And when we think about Joseph, we see what is sown into Joseph's life and his family. There's so much, right from the outset, we have lies, pain, grief, division, injustice, if you like, everything is piling up that the future is not looking bright for Joseph or this family. In the natural, on the earth, in fact, it looks like surely these things are going to sow so much pain and division in the days ahead. It does not look like a positive future. But Stephen, remember, is stood at the doorway of heaven and earth. And we are encouraged to see Joseph in that place as well. Yes, there is a just wave after wave of difficulties and unjust situations that he is accused of even after being sold into slavery. It happens again and again, but we are being reminded again and again that God did not close heaven to him. It was that that was not the case. Heaven was open and even on the earth, God was providing for him the most incredible way. We keep seeing this is all happening, but God is behaving in this way towards Joseph, but God is with him. What an incredible line to stand on in our lives. But God was with him, we're told. But God rescued him, we're told. But God granted him favour and wisdom, we are told. We have a generous God being displayed towards Joseph, despite all he is facing. Joseph may have had no earthly family looking out for him. It seems to be very clear. But his heavenly father never stopped providing for him. And as I was thinking about it, it reminded me of one of the Psalms of David. Let me just read you some verses from Psalm 27, verse 10 through to verse 14. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. What an incredible encouragement to us today. What an incredible encouragement to you and me. I don't know what situations you're facing in your life, what worries you have about the future, but here we have a strong word from Stephen, a strong word, if you like, from Joseph, a strong word here from David of who our God is on this earth to his people who call on his name and who will see his provision in the most impossible circumstances. And of course, that is what we see with Joseph. The second thing I wanted to emphasise out of that um, initial look at the jealousy and the opposition that Joseph faced is that Stephen um, again and again seems to mention the, uh, something about the land that Joseph found himself in. 
And it seems that um, Stephen wants to present that God was not just with Joseph, but he was with Joseph in a foreign land, in the land of Egypt. And in these small verses here, we see that six times Egypt is mentioned again and again. He's trying to bring to the forefront of his argument, of his defence, that this is a God who does not just work in some narrow fashion for a narrow group of people, but is actually working on behalf of all um, humanity who has a desire to work in this world. The heart of God keeps breaking through. Stephen is highlighting the faithfulness of God, the commitment of God to his people, to his purposes, that they are not narrow geographically. They do not just relate to a narrow group of people living in a narrow land on this earth, but the heart of God, that through God's people, all the nations would be blessed, that we might discover there is a God of provision, In this difficult, dark world, there is a God who provides. There is an open heaven over our lives. You know, we're introduced to Joseph, who from these early days has now matured in his spiritual gifting, in that prophetic gifting. And we see he's able to interpret Pharaoh's dream accurately and is brought into this incredible cooperation with God all these years later, where actually he is being used by the Lord to bring food and provision after in this terrible seven years of famine you know we have so much against us in the world at this time and some nations experiencing in tremendous amounts of opposition against them at this time but actually here we see even in the depths of a seven-year famine God has been at work through Joseph through his life and now through Joseph is able to show his provision show the character of God it's like in this furnace that Joseph has been in of difficulty as he's kept open to the Lord we see not only has he been physically saved by the Lord not only has he been physically preserved but actually his very heart has been preserved. His character has been preserved. We find a man, if you like, who looks like our God, who is representing him there in Egypt, feeding the people, providing for them. We may think they don't deserve it. We may think we don't deserve it today, but we have a God of faithfulness, a God of provision, a God of love. And just as he's preserved the character here of Joseph, we see that God is preserving Stephen even his character the gold in this furnace that Stephen is in is coming out what an incredible thought for you and I I I wonder what you think would happen if you were Joseph in that moment where his brothers appear before him I wonder what you would be worried might pop out of your mouth or out of your actions in that moment. We would feel justified, wouldn't we, for Joseph to finally cut off his brothers, for justice to be done in that way. Okay, this is what you did to me. Now I'm going to do it to you. We're going to level it out. We're going to level the playing field here. But you know what? The words of Joseph are incredibly moving because we see the character of our God in them. I'm just going to read you the response in Genesis 45. I'm going to just read verse 4 to 11. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourself for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land and for the next five years there will be no ploughing or reaping but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. And then in Genesis 46, we see the family come and Joseph weeps on seeing his father. It says this, as soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. We also read that Jacob himself received a revelation, a fresh revelation from God to go forward, to go into Egypt, to receive this provision, that it was safe to go forward. God is at move in this family. 
blessing starts to flow out where we may think it's not even deserved. You know, it was on my heart to share today that this is our God. This is the God of Abraham. This is the God of Joseph. This is Stephen's God. This is our God. And in the words that we've looked at here of Stephen and Joseph, the false accusations, standing, standing firm, not just physically um, preserved, but also um, at these moments, but also their character still looking like the character of God shining in this world. We think of Jesus, don't we? How they're reflecting him, reflecting the accusations that came against him, the false accusations that he faced and the woundings and the abuse that he faced for us and the victory of his overcoming death and the grave. And we see the provision of God, that death could not hold him, the provision of God for his people. And I believe the Lord wants to bring into view his faithfulness and provision for us today and for his people. You know, I was reminded when I was thinking of this story today of the prodigal son. I don't know if it came into your mind when you think about brothers and how they treat fathers and uh, and perfect fathers and not so perfect fathers we've seen maybe in Jacob. But in the prodigal son in Luke 15, we have this incredible picture of a perfect loving father. But we also, if you read through that story, we have the reaction of a jealous older son. Yes, we have a younger son who does not seem to um, deserve anything, doesn't seem to deserve provision, doesn't seem to deserve love or forgiveness, but we see a father who is willing to love and forgive this misguided brother. But we have the older brother who finds it so difficult. And in Luke 15, we have this, the father says to the older son, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. And you know, I was thinking today, have we found in our lives, has jealousy been eating away in your heart and life? Has there been seeds sown where you have felt competitive towards other Christians, maybe jealous or envious of the gifts that they have or the way that God is using them? Have you thought or wished for ways that people would be removed out of your friendship circle or out of your church even because you feel envious and jealous of the position or even of the way that God is using them? You know, there is an invitation today. It's an invitation from the Father he wants you to come to him and to know that all he has is yours. He wants to provide for you. He loves you. He is for you. He wants to deliver you from that root of jealousy and competition and envy in your heart, in my heart today, that we can be people that stand on that doorway. We can be people who live on this earth. We may face all kinds of injustice. We may have faced all kinds of injustice in our lives, but there is an open heaven, our father, our perfect, father who does not make mistakes is calling you he's calling me today and he's saying all I have is yours will you share in it will you step into it or will you keep yourself on the edges constantly feeling on the edge that you don't deserve it and competing with your brothers and sisters in Christ you know the Lord is inviting you to step past it today to be delivered to be forgiven to come into the full provision that there is for you in him so I would like to pray for us, if that's okay, this morning. I would like to pray also for those of us who maybe we have faced false accusations in our lives. Maybe we have also faced some terrible abuse or injustice in our lives. Something has gone against us. And maybe we feel held to those moments. You know, it'd be easy, wouldn't it, for Joseph to feel held to that moment when that terrible thing happened to him from his brothers, where he was sold into slavery. It could have defined the whole of his life. And don't we know, maybe other people or others who have found that, sadly, that one moment in their lives is defined the whole of their future. Do you know what this scripture is encouraging us? Stephen is encouraging us that we can, by God's great grace and love and faithfulness for you today, he can meet you in that place where there was accusation and hurt and pain and he can show you that he is with you. Yes, the world may forsake you. Yes, even your mother and father may forsake you, but he will never forsake you. You can know his provision. You can know his nearness. I'm going to pray for us and then hand back to Debbie. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you today for this opportunity 
to think again on Joseph's life, to think again about Stephen's life, lives lived in the goodness of God, lives lived in the provision and faithfulness of God. Not because they had what looked like perfect lives, both had great opposition against them. But you, Lord, your face was towards them. And Lord, this morning, I feel, Lord, that this is your heart for us, that you want to remind us, you want to reveal to us that you are towards us, that your face is towards us, that you are provider, that you don't want to leave us, you don't want us caught into a deception that what we see with our earthly eyes is the reality and the full stop on our situation. That, Lord, you want to show us heaven, you want to open heaven, you want us to glimpse and see your glory, you want us to experience your nearness you want our characters to not be robbed from us through difficult experiences but that more and more we might become like you in this world that Lord we might see many other people blessed that we might see the goodness of God going out into this world people who maybe don't deserve it like us being provided for in a famine in a dark time and Lord we can be your people on this earth and we thank you that you want to provide for us. Lord, I do pray for those that have found jealousy and envy taking root in their lives. Jealousy particularly of other people in the church, other believers, envious of other people, feel competitive towards others. Lord, we want to honestly bring you our broken selves today, Lord, and we ask that you would deliver us, Lord, and forgive us and cleanse us from all wrong competition and jealousy in our hearts. Lord, that we would see your faces towards us. You are a perfect father and all that you have is ours. Lord, may we be drawn into a joyful relationship with you, full of your provision and kindness and goodness. And Lord, I particularly pray for those who have had a great injustice done to them, a wrong done to them in the past, and it has still, um, held them to that moment. They do not feel free. Lord Jesus, I pray that the story of Joseph might penetrate to the depths of our lives today and that in Jesus' name we would not be wrongly held by any evil done to us, but that, Lord, we might again experience your presence, your power in that place, your love in that place, that your face is towards us, that those actions don't reflect your heart. But, Lord, in this world we will have trouble, but we're to take heart because you have overcome the world. Lord, draw us us deeply into that place, I pray today in the name of Jesus. Amen.